morning. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it is potluck, potluck Sunday. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I know that quite a few people are away this weekend, but it uh, looks like there's going to be more than enough tasties uh, for us to enjoy. If you didn't bring something, please still stay, enjoy some, uh, enjoy some food with us. Make it up next month, yeah, make it up next month, bring extra. Uh, we know that our very first official MOPS group, uh, there's been training, there's been practices, takes place on Tuesday, correct Amber? So uh, I encourage you to pray for that. I mean, with all the planning, there's still the reality of what actually happens once you start going and you have to adjust accordingly. So uh, a lot of, let's cover that with prayer, cover that with prayer. Uh, anything else? When's prayer? What day's prayer? City prayer? Third Monday. Third Monday, city prayer, the park, it's 11 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, pray for me. I said I have that uh, teaching I'm doing in uh, California uh, for up-and-coming ministers and such. It's a six-hour course. Uh, I don't know who it's going to be harder on, them or me, but, uh, uh, you know, honored and uh, happy to help with just uh, six hours of teaching. And you know, the funny thing is, talking for six hours didn't bother me, but making sense during those six hours, that, that gets a little harder. That gets a little harder. Anything else needs to be mentioned? Oh, uh, one o'clock today is a 9-11 memorial at the fire station, if I understood the date correctly. I think so. Did anyone else hear that information? But don't eat and run. Okay, know. yeah, yeah. And we should be done on time. You can, you can still have your one o'clock, and you can still have your meal and get there too. All right. If there's nothing else to be mentioned, <clears throat> let us sing praises to the Lord. Welcome back. Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war, I confess my hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't get the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through When you don't get the answers, as I cry out to you Part the waters, 
I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers As I cry out to you Miss Twyla is at home resting today, and so I am going to be your prayer partner this morning. Um, I really wanted to bring a scripture to you from this morning, trying to find it on my handy dandy phone. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock, Isaiah 26, and I can't read the verse because my eyes can't see it. So there you go. It's in Isaiah, Isaiah 26. Um, Today is 9-11, and we remember this country has been through an awful lot between that, COVID, you know, and then we go through our own personal things, whether it's health, family, relationships, whatever, whatever it is. Um, Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is our eternal rock. That's who we trust in. He is a trustworthy God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, God, we come to you this morning. We thank you, God. You're a Father who loves us. And if we asked for bread, you would never give us a stone, God. We bring to you this morning our country first of all, God. It seems like we have moments of of, um, terror attacks or COVID and people uh, start thinking about coming to you, God, but then life returns to normal. Oh, God, I pray for souls this morning. I pray, God, for our country, that we would be a country of revival, that we would turn our hearts back toward you, God. God, I pray for our church, Lord, as we are moving out in faith and mops, Lord, and so many people have invested so much already and it doesn't even start till Tuesday. But God, you know the sacrifice of each one. God, would you bless it? Lord, would you bring the moms that you want to bring here, Lord? Would, we, would they find a kind, loving church family, Lord, to be able to come around them and bless them and lift them up? and encourage them, Lord. I pray, God, for those who are having health difficulties. God, you are our healer. I pray that you would give wisdom to doctors, but God, we know where our healing comes from, and I thank you for physicians, and I thank you for medical miracles and all of those things, God. But we lift our need to you, and we ask for healing. God, I ask that each one of us, Lord, would be hungry for you, God, would be hungry for your word, that we would walk in your ways. God, and just, I want to thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place and in me. Oh, God, do a work in us that we might be the light and love to our community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. you like, please stand. Okay. Man of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You 
are strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, He's Lord of heaven and earth. to all. He's Lord of heaven and earth. We've been through fire. We've been through rain. We've been refined by the power of His name. We've fallen deeper in love with You. You've brought the truth on all Shout to the north and the south. Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to all He's Lord of heaven and earth Rise up church with broken wings Fill this place with songs again Of our God who reigns on high By His grace again Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to all He's Lord of heaven and earth Yes, we will shout to the north and the south To the east and the west Yes, He's Lord of heaven and earth. Yes, He's Lord of heaven and earth. Hopefully no one was wearing headphones out there on the internet. Wow. Sorry about that. We woke everybody up. Your love speaks a better word All the empty claims Heard upon this earth Righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your blood speaks a better word. All the empty claims heard upon this earth. It's righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. can wash us pure as snow, welcome as the friends of God, nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Testifies and grace of the Father's heart. 
make a way for us. Boldly we approach by earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but your blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure and smooth? Welcome as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Us. We thank you for the blood. We, are we thank you for the blood. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. We praise you for the blood. Your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus. Please have a seat. Absolutely no idea what caused that major popping sound. But uh, I'm sure it wasn't me. <clears throat> Last week, and it, we, we even kind of built up to it, we were talking a couple weeks ago about uh, communion. We talked about how there is that verse where the Apostle Paul says, if you take communion in an unworthy manner, that's why some of you are sick and have fallen asleep. We talked about that a bit. And of course, last week, we talked about Paul using many references of judgment from the Old Testament to warn Christians on how they live their lives. No one likes to talk about those things. I'm not saying you should preach about the same point every single you know, Sunday of God's wrath and judgment. You know, there is that stereotypical hell, fire, and brimstone kind of thing. I haven't run across it too much, but... It's a stereotype. It must have been around for a while. Well, a person came up to me last week and said, I don't think there's a single topic you haven't just charged at and taken on, you know, social, what, you know. That was a compliment, but I got to thinking about it. There is a topic I've never covered in over seven years. Part of the reason is I often go through entire books. We've gone through Paul's letters, the book of Revelation. We've gone through Gospels, Old Testament stuff. And it just doesn't come up that much if, you know, if you're just reading in general. Now, certainly you could make it come up, just start up a sermon and start quoting bits and pieces from all over the place. But like uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 13 is about love. You know, Hebrews 11 is about faith. These chapters have a topic. And if you read them, you get the big picture. And there's just not that many big chapters that talk about this particular topic, which is still a mystery to you, isn't it? Well, there's a reason for that. This is one of the least favorite topics a preacher could preach on. And I know that. Uh, but there are a couple of chapters that do give us some guidance on it. So there is a teaching that can be readily found. I did not tell anybody I was preaching on this topic. I kept it sealed hermetically under a key that I was, this is the topic. No one's going to know. My own wife doesn't know. And yet, oddly enough, the attendance today is less than half it was last week. <laughs> Just makes you wonder, doesn't it? Makes you wonder. 
What is this topic? Giving. Giving. Why is it such a bad topic? Well, I think it's been somewhat abused uh, over the years in many different forms, especially on some TV uh, type preaching, some TV preachers. Uh, you know, I saw a sermon one time. He mentioned money more than he mentioned Jesus. You know, uh, well, kind of makes you wonder what the point of that sermon was about. You know, money. And of course, send it on in, and that's what you need to do. Uh, that, that was the point of the sermon. Uh, there was a famous one. The guy was preaching about why he deserved $3 million a year. It was actually a sermon preached by a uh, well-known uh, Los Angeles preacher at one point. My hope is that if we stick to the verses, look at what the chapters say, not a verse here or a verse there, what we see here will be somewhat different than what we've seen on TV. Follow me along. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Another reason I want to do this is I always mention 1 Corinthians. Every chapter is another mess up. Every chapter they're trying to deal with something. Apostle Paul's going to put the fire out. Don't mention 2 Corinthians as much, but on this topic of giving, it does, it does come into play here. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth. And now, brothers and sisters, brethren... We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Macedonia, above Greece. Verse 2. In the midst of a very severe trial, you know, they're having a rough time, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege to share in this service to the Lord's people. He's taken up a collection to take to Judea. Judea is having a rough time. And here are these people, and even though it says they are uh, impoverished, uh, they're overflowing with joy in their extreme poverty and welled up with rich generosity. Uh, And, of course, you need to read these verses and think for yourself what it all does and how it applies. But I can't help but read this and apply this to this little church, this fellowship of people. How in the midst of their poverty, they uh, they had rich generosity. We saw this live action during 2020. We didn't know how to keep a church service going. You couldn't buy any video equipment. I'm talking to a cell phone. I don't know who's out there. I can't even tell. The cell phone's over there. No one's in the building. I mean, it was a horrible time. And during that time, people gave. That we were able to build our building and keep going with some more playground stuff and you know, on and on. And even though, what, what kind of time? They were hard times. They were difficult times. There was unemployment. And in fact, I felt kind of bad about it. I had like, I had like survivor's guilt because I had pastor friends whose churches were tanking. I had pastor friends who not only had lost their, their, their congregation had disappeared, uh, their own jobs were in jeopardy if they were bi, bi, bivocational. How's that for, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire? And here I am saying, oh my gosh, look at all this money coming in suddenly. As if God turned the faucet on full blast for a year. Uh, it was amazing. And, and during our most difficult time, and that's what you see here, these Macedonians gave, verse 3, for I testify they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Did they have to do it? Were they forced to do it? No. Entirely on their own. This is going to come up more than once, this thought, of their own volition. Now, I've heard some... Some, some preachings on tithing and giving. Uh, when it was over, it didn't sound like it was optional or, you know, or on your own volition. It's not like you better or else. That's not the same thing. Verse 4. Uh, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Verse 6. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made uh, a beginning, 
to bring also to completion the act of grace on your part. This giving he calls an act of grace on your part. Verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. He just called it a grace of giving as part of grace. Uh, People know that some churches are called charismatic churches. And of course, the word charisma often refers to the natural born leader type person. You know, they draw people under them. They're the, you know, for whatever reason. And I could tell early on in school, some people were just the popular kids and they, they had that, whatever that it was. You know, it just seemed like some got it and some don't, you know. That's not what this word charisma means. Charis is the Greek word for grace. Charisma or charismata, that little suffix, means little bits. And it's often translated as spiritual gift. And of course, in some churches, in charismatic churches, there might be the gift of tongues and prophecy and healings and all these different things. Those are charismatic, or Pentecostal is another term, but charismatic gifts, gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts. He's calling giving one of those. In fact, he does it again, Romans 12, verse 6. He explains, we have different gifts according to the grace given each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And some of the things he adds to these kind of make you wonder. If your gift is prophecy, he said in verse 6, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. So your gift is prophecy, but it's supposed to be in balance with your faith. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned this before. I've been to some church services where there was a prophet. And a lot of times he said stuff which to me sounded like a fortune cookie. I'm not making that up. A fortune cookie says, you know, hey, you're going to come into some riches soon. Doesn't say when or how much, right? So you can fulfill it all by yourself. You find five bucks in the couch. Oh, fortune cookie was right, right? Right? It could be someone get insurance says they overcharged, you get a check back for 100 bucks. Ah, this must be what the fortune cookie was talking about, right? And that's the kind of prophecies, you know, uh, you're having some hard times. Well, yeah, who isn't having hard times, you know? You're going to have some good times. Yeah, yeah, we all want to have some good times. They were very general, vague prophecies, if you will. However, I tell the story all the time, I went to one where the guy was, he walked up to me and, and spoke to me. And it felt like he was hitting home. I mean, I was uncomfortable, some of the things he was saying to me, like he was, you know, like he was reading my mail, you know, as the phrase goes. But that wasn't the clincher. Our best friend church attender at the time walked up to me and says, where do you know that guy from? I said, I've never met him before in my life. He says, boy, he sure knows you. And then the same meeting, Gwen's father, when he was still alive, walks up to me and says, man, you know everybody, don't you? I said, I've never met that man before in my life. He's like, oh, well, he knows you. You know, it wasn't just what I felt. It was also confirmed. That this guy may have been definitely working in accordance to his faith, while some of those other ones may have had it out of balance. But it says with a few others, prophesy, uh, prophesy if it is serving, serve, if it is teaching, teach. Does it say how many you have to teach? No. In fact, there's some stories told of, you know, I wish I could remember who it was. I can't. Uh, this gal drove her wagon up in the foothills to some little camp and taught Sunday school to four to five kids or something like that. You know, and like two of them. One's a famous preacher and the other one's a statesman or something because she went up there and tried to teach them Bible stories and other things. You know, uh, only five kids, not that much. Wouldn't be, but depends on, you know, what the outcome is. It's worth it. It's worth it. Encourage, uh, give, do it generously. Why? Because you can also give and do it, you know, uh, with a certain amount of uh, regret or a certain amount of resistance. Uh, you know, if I have to, I guess I will. 
But do it. If you're going to give, do it generously. Lead, do it diligently. Is there a way of leading and not being diligent? Yes. Yes, we usually call them managers at the places I've worked. That's a half joke, half true. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Why does it say that? Because again, you could be showing mercy and forgiving people and bitterness can grow and resentment. And it says here, if you're going to show mercy and forgive people and do it cheerfully. And that is Romans 12 talking about spiritual gifts and giving, just like it was in 2 Corinthians 8, is mentioned there to continue in 2 Corinthians 8. Look what he says. I am not commanding you. I've gone as a, you must give 10%. You must, some people argue, do you go gross? Do you go net? You know, the more spiritual ones go gross. You know, I, it, it doesn't say that. I am not commanding you, but I want to test your sincerity uh, of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. And it is, it is a test. How you use your money explains all sorts of things. What's important to you? I remember uh, a particular person, and I just, I've heard this story many times, but let's just say they got themselves a boat, maybe a jet ski or two, you know, and a trailer and something to holler with, and they're polishing and chroming it, running it out in the driveway, just getting ready for the weekend, you know, and the family becomes resentful. Why? Because time and resources are all going towards a boat and not to them. They feel left out. They feel neglected. They feel overlooked. Again, this, put in whatever hobby or item you want. This story, I've heard this story over and over and over again. Uh, why? Because what you spend your time and money on is what you love. Well, if you love Christian things and God and, and his e- and efforts on earth, well then, it, obviously you will show that in your time and finances. For, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty uh, might become rich. So Jesus, who sat with the Father, came to earth in the most meager of circumstances, a stable, a trough, whatever. And from that, led his life to be executed on a cross like a thief. Well, that's certainly going from rich to poor. And why? For our sins. That you may be rich. Rich in eternal life. Rich in the forgiveness of sins. All those frees that were playing on the video. Free from guilt. Free from All those things. So he's saying Jesus did the same thing. Verse 10. And here is my judgment about what's best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give but also have the desire to do so. This isn't the first time around. He said last year they had the same type of collection. He says now, verse 11, Now finish the work so your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Sounds like you said you were going to. Now's the time to do it. You know, may your actions meet your words. Most of us like people like that. When people's actions don't meet their words, most of us dislike people who are like that. We often call them brothers-in-laws and things. That's a, a half joke. Half joke. Seventy-five percent. And then look what he says in verse eleven. Now finish the work that your eagerness may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. What does that mean? Give according to what you got. He's not setting a specific total. Each one of you must raise. So much. One thing I refused to do during the building project was put the fundraiser thermometer on the wall. I would not do it. And, you know, and then every time you come to church, well, we want to be here and we're right, right here and everybody needs to get us, you know. I've been to those church services. That's all they talk about. As if you build a new wing and thousands of people will be saved. Just because they have a place to sit? No, their hearts have to change. Christians have to be faithful in kindness and good deeds and in in fellowship. There's all sorts of things Christians can do. And it doesn't have to be that little thermometer rising each and every week. It says, now finish the work, according to your means. Verse 12. For if the willingness is not there, uh, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, 
not according to what one does not have. So, and we've talked about this a hundred thousand times, it's not just the action, it's the motive. I've talked about this. A guy can come to your door. He can tell you what a lovely home you have, a lovely yard. He'll, he'll say, it, you could be, you know, gray-haired and don't have your makeup on. Is your mother home? You know, whatever. They might say anything. Why? Because they're going to try to sell you something. So all these platitudes and nice things are just to butter you up. Not for, your, for whose benefit? For theirs. They're doing these things for their benefit. And when you realize that, somehow all the words seem pale, very pale. I used to, you know, those old enough to remember the way Eddie Haskell would talk when a parent came around, you know, similar, similar stuff. And it doesn't mean much. That's not really where their heart's at. They just want to make money. So it's about your attitude. And that verse, uh, for the, the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not. So you don't have to hit a particular mark. You have to mean it. We say the same thing when we take communion. You should mean it. It should mean something to you. The attitude of the heart, the motive. Same thing taking place here. Uh, verse 13. Our desire is not that others might be, uh, uh, others might be relieved uh, while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. He explains. Verse 14. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Their goal is, uh, the goal is equity. As it is written, the one who gathered uh, much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. He's quoting from Exodus. He's quoting when the, when the bread uh, from heaven, the manna fell. And the people collected each day as they wandered through the desert. That was their, their provision for the day. And guess what? The person who needed much got what he needed, and, the person, and they all got it equally and enough, and they were, God provided for them. What's he saying? God will provide for you too. Verse 16. Thanks be, uh, thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus. Titus, uh, Paul wrote a book to Titus, right after Timothy, Titus. The same concerns I have for you. Verse 17, for Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm on his own initiative. Verse 18, we are sending along, now watch this next part, this is just, uh, we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. Who is this mystery man? He, he continues, what is more, he this mystery person, was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our ignorance. Uh, our ignorance. We want to avoid any criticism in the way we administer this liberal gift. So he hasn't explained who the mystery person is, but in verse 20 he does say, we want to do this right, and as we distribute it, you know, fair to all and, and right in everyone's eyes. And then he says very clearly, verse 21, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Well, I would argue that a Christian, when it comes right down to it, do you do what man wants or what God wants? Well, you do what God says. And that could be in relation to morality or ethics or, you know, all sorts of things, you know. Uh, there's been many times throughout world history that religion has been condemned considered illegal by whatever regime takes over. It could happen. Do you stop praying? Do you stop reading your Bible? You know, because the government said so. But he does say he wants to do not only oh, sorry, in the eyes of the Lord, but also right. you are silly if you don't think the way you behave has a witness to it. You know, we will be nice and holy and pleasant to each one another and we'll treat everyone, treat everyone outside these walls like they're filth. Right? Some churches could do that. We're the in crowd, they're not. We're the good, we're the lucky, they're the bad, we're in, we're, they're out. He's worried about what they're going to think, what they're going to say. And we should too. Does that mean you appease every single man who desire and say everything's okay? No. But you take into account what's, what, what might work best, what's going to look good, what's going to look right, as opposed to just, oh, it doesn't matter what he thinks, it's all about the Lord. No, what he thinks is important because you're trying to win him over. 
Uh, you know, I mean, back to the salesperson, I do not encourage you to go up and just lie to a person about their yard, their age, and everything else. But there are things you, you don't do. You know, as a salesperson, you don't walk up, um, gosh, I don't want to bother you. Do, you. do you need anything? Okay, bye. Right? You just take a, that's not a, that salesman's not going to make a lot of money. Right? Why? He's doing it wrong. Right? He's doing it wrong. I'm not saying you've got to do everything the other way, but there is, a, there is a way that's going to work with the opinion of men. In addition, look at this, verse 22. In addition, we are sending with them our brother, another one, who has often proven to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because his great confidence in you. That's two mystery men. Now, the only reason I show, point this out is that I'm sure there's people out there that just try to research and guess and plan and think, who are these mystery people? And it is odd, because uh, generally the apostle just mentions other people by name. You know, Mark is with me, Luke's, and, you know, send Luke, he, you know, Mark, he's worthy to me in my ministry, and so-and-so isn't around anymore, and he mentions them all by name. But here, they're just kind of a veiled reference. People sp- probably spend hours and hours and hours trying to you know, figure out this. I encourage you not to. What's the point of this chapter? Giving. Why would you stop there and just, you know, people do, but I'm encouraging you not to. Don't be that guy. They're out there. Be warned, but don't be that guy. Uh, and he goes on, as, as for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, whoever they are, they are representatives of the churches and honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the, the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. You know, may they find a good offering. May they be able to hold it back. It goes into chapter 9. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help. You have been boasting about it to the Ma- I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them since last year, uh, you and Achaia uh, were ready to give northern Greece. I mean, Macedonia is above that, but northern Greece. Or is that southern? That's southern. Uh, and we're ready to give. In fact, if you ever look at Greece, uh, there's a big island. There's a big part of it that's actually connected. That's where Corinth is, a little strip of land. And Achaia is a, the, the big chunk. Excuse me. Telling them that since last year you were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them into action. The way you act and behave can encourage others, either to the plus or to the minus. Still true to this day in all the things that you do. Uh, I, I, I often say this. I often go to other churches uh, and I learn what to or what not to do. You know, sometimes whatever that guy's doing, I'm not going to do that, you know. And sometimes that's a good idea. You learn from examples of other people. Verse, uh, uh, verse 3, uh, I'm sending the brothers. that, an, or, And I'm going to read a lot of this because, again, I want you to compare the, the average tithing given sermon to what this actually says. I'm sending the brothers in order that our boast about you in this matter should not prove to be hollow, but to be ready, as I said you would be. For if any in Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. Oh yeah, we're going to go over here and pick up the, the offering they talked about. And then you get there, there's no offering. Well, it looks bad on the guy who took everybody over there. It looks bad on them when they got there. Easy enough to understand that. Verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you have promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not one grudgingly given. Not one grudgingly given. And he is. He's, he's not saying you must do this because this is right. He's actually saying, I hope you're going to do what you said you were going to do. That's different. That's what he's saying. He said, you said you were going to give a gift. We're going to come prepare to get the gift. He's based on what they said, their integrity in their own words. This is not the same as you must give, you must give, you must give. The thermostat, you know, marker has to come up. It must be 10%, you know, gross. it's, It's not saying that currently. 
remember this, verse 6. Now, here's a fun one. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So if you give a little bit, you're going to get a little bit. And if you give a lot, you might get a lot. Now, that's exactly what it's saying. But there is a twisted interpretation of this. And it's back to the motive thing. If you trust in God and give and watch him take care of your needs anyway, and how he does that is beyond me. How, how money was going to show up during a pandemic? No clue. In fact, that first, I think one of the first Sundays as the pandemic really got bad, there was three people here. I think there was $20 in the offering plate or something like that. Going to be hard to keep the lights on that way. Going to be hard to keep the lights on 20 bucks a week let alone the water and the garbage and all those other things. Uh, and you looked at that, and, but within a, few, within a month or so after that, we were looking towards building the building. It changed that much in a month during the most difficult time. God, God can do these things. And people gave uh, large amounts of cash to help us have some real bathrooms and a kitchen and a meeting hall. But some people sow sparingly. They're, and it's a matter of faith. This is a matter of faith. If you think God can't possibly help you with your finances, well, you're certainly not going to give much away. And if you think God can't help you with your finances, you might be more inclined to give something away. Just that simple. Now, I'm talking about there is a, a horrible application of this verse. You take it and it becomes, I want more money, therefore I'll give God more money so I can get. Well, now who's it about? It's about you. You're actually just trying to get money. God just happens to be the, the method you're using as opposed to a slot machine or, you know, a stock market or whatever else. He is just your, 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 your mode of operation. It's about you. This reminds me of the guy who could care less about his aunt. But every, every time, every birthday comes around, he gives her a card and a kiss on the cheek. Why? Because she's filthy rich. Does he truly love his aunt? Not necessarily. Does he want to make sure he's still in the will? Yes. Why is he being nice and kind and trying? For himself. So even though it's a good verse and it makes perfect sense, it does get blown out of proportion and people use it and claim it to make themselves rich. I encourage you not to apply it that way. Each of you, verse 7, should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Who decides what you're going to give? You and your heart. And it says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'll hear a sermon on the radio or a tithing sermon or something like that, and in my mind, I'm just waiting for this verse to pop up. You know? Because really, if the guy's building the big 10% fee, if the guy's going through that, this verse isn't going to help him any. Because this verse just said, it's up to you and your heart. Not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And every now and then I'm pleasantly surprised when I do hear it. But I will admit most often when I hear a man preaching on tithing, this verse does not come up. And it's right here in the middle of the chapter. goes with some of the other things he's been saying. It's, and really, the biggest part about tithing isn't anything I'm going to say. It's between you and God and your heart. And that can be quite a battle sometimes. It can be quite a battle. God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. Uh, they, uh, he's quoting from Psalms. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. What do you get back if you give to a poor person? Well, it's not going to be a big Christmas present. Probably not even a card. You know, you do that because God's watching. You want to you wanna do what's right because you have compassion for those less fortunate. Uh, who, that's one type of giving. The other type of giving is like we already mentioned, hoping to get something better in return. Many years ago, we were, we were visiting Gwen's Aunt and uncle, they've gone on to be with the Lord since then. Lived their lives, church folk their whole life. His mother was a, a Methodist mission, a preacher, preacher of some sort in Texas back in the... He was a World War II vet, so she'd have been in the 
Depression era before that, right? Even took us to the, the little church that she had built and used in Texas there, Denton, Texas. And it was probably about, what, a third of this room, half this room? It was, but that was a church. And, you know, he comes from a long, his whole life had been Christianity. And long in age, I think he was well into his late 70s. Not that that's old for some of you. Uh, but he, was, he looked back at his whole life. He reflected on the whole thing and he said, I've lived better on 90 cents out of the dollar than most people do on a dollar. He could look back over his whole life and realize he'd given away, in his case, 10%. And he was no worse off for it from what he could tell. Even better off. And by the time we knew him, they just upgraded their house and bought a new truck. And he was a janitor. He was a school janitor. <clears throat> now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase and store your seed, which will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. Now, there's another point here, which is not what you hear on TV. The one on TV is, if you want to get people saved, send the money in. If you want to help get double blessed and money back, send money in. Right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you want to see God work, the way you use your money, you can see him work. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. So why, why will he give you things? So you can be more generous, so you can give more away. And through all your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, this service that you perform, not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession, the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Uh, at the end of each year, this church has sent money to Africa for a time, uh, lately, we've been sending money to a, a ministry and a church in Burma, uh, Myanmar. Uh, we actually get a letter from them thanking us for it. And it's funny, on the, uh, uh, the YouTube demographics or the, the, the stats or the Facebook stats, it shows who's been watching. And it, I have to admit, not a lot of people watch the channel regularly, you know. But uh, uh, really, a long, long time ago, I realized... If I had a good sermon, I'm not saying all of them are, but if I had a good one, and I preach it, and there was 20 people in this room, 20 people are going to hear it, and no one else is ever going to hear it. So if one or two people watch it online, that's one or two people more. Well, I'm looking at the things, and most of the people are from Fernley, some Reno, you know. There was a, a Indiana, uh, and there was a couple from Burma, and a couple from Africa. I'm not quite sure how that one happened. Uh, and they pop up on there once a month as tuning in to watch some part or portion of a sermon. Uh, are they thankful for us giving? Are they checking up on us? I don't know all the details. I don't speak a lot of Burmese and I don't plan to head to that part of the world anytime soon. It could happen. Uh, but is it our generosity? Is it our kindness? Is it our making a difference for people? And again, uh, we also take a great deal of uh, uh, money in helping with the pregnancy center. Now, you may not be find yourself in a, a crisis pregnancy, but people do, agreed, all the time. And the money we put together, because we don't, we don't actually turn a profit on the rent. We actually generally lose money each year. The amount of rent we charge versus maintenance, uh, one big maintenance bill actually can take up a year or two of rent. And we're looking at doing a roof. So if we did make money last year, it will, it, it, it's gone. And yet we're helping people. What kind of people? People in They may not know we're helping them, but God knows. And has he not blessed us? People, I'm sure people very, uh, very logically minded, financial type people could look and say, these two buildings could rent for this much. You're renting it for this much. You need to rent it for this much, and that kind of money will help you build your new building. True. I can see the math working out on that. And we didn't, and we gave it away, and we have a building anyway. I, 
I'm not making this stuff up. There is no one, you could, I'm, I'm serious, you could look at the church books. We made this much this year, this much this year, this much this year. 2020 pandemic, nobody's here, this much. 2021, right back to where, you know. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can graph it. I'm not just making things up. It's there, you, you figure that out. I say it's God. I say it goes right along with what we're reading. <clears throat> the service you perform, uh, not only supplies the needs of the Lord's people, the service which you provided, uh, let's go to verse 14, uh, and the prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. <laughs> uh, somebody may not know it, but this church helped them at a horrible time when they were young and pregnant, didn't know what to do. They may not know it, but we know. Uh, some, some little church in Burma somewhere may have a new roof or something or whatever. Uh, and some of them may know it because they're tuning in and watching the service once in a while. Uh, real quick, there is a passage in Malachi chapter 3. Uh, and it's about giving. Look what he says, verse 6. And this is a comprehensive view of this giving topic based on massive portions of Scripture and not just onesie verses I can pull in and make my points. Because I, the Lord, do not change. The descendants of Jacob have been destroyed. Judgment. Yet from the days of your fathers you have turned away from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord. This is a reoccurring theme. With, with the Israelites. But you ask, how can we return? Uh, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But how? Uh, how? But, but you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Now here the word tithe is being used, which is a tenth. So that there may be food in my house. And look what it says there. Highlight these words. Test me in this. Says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of your land or the vine in your fields. It will not fall, fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed. You will be the land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This can be, this, this topic of giving can be faith building. You can start off very small, especially if you don't give much at all. Some people do. Some people do. They know what it's like. They, they've seen it. Even though I write a check each month for this much, I'm doing okay. You know? Amazing. How's this happening? But some people don't, so I'd encourage you, based on this, it says, test me this. Are you supposed to test God? No. There's a verse about that. Don't test the Lord your God. But here, God's actually saying, on this particular topic, test me. Test me. So could you start off small? Sure. And this is not a biblical passage, but uh, just a church, uh, running a church passage. We try to plan our finances as best we can. And if people gave, try to give regularly. I'm not talking about massive, but regularly it helps us plan. But if it's a little here and a little there and not, someone goes on vacation and they, you know, they don't, for three weeks and you don't get a check for three weeks, uh, it makes it very difficult to plan the finances. I'm saying it can be faith building. And as your faith builds, uh, George Mueller famous for his orphanages, which ran on faith, God just provided, said, the beginning of anxiety is the ending of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. He knew that over time he saw the Lord provided, the Lord provided, the Lord provided. You just don't worry as much anymore. Why? Because the Lord can provide. Think about some of these other quotes. The only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. J.L. Kraft of Kraft Cheese. 
Jim Elliott, missionary. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Treasures in heaven. F.B. Meyer. He is the richest man in the esteem of the world who has gotten the most. He is the richest man in the esteem of heaven who has given the most. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Winston Churchill. And then uh, J. Vernon McGee, walked through the Bible, says, don't tell me you're trusting God until you trust him with your pocketbook. Larry Burkett says, this, oh, he's been gone 20 years now, the average Christian pays more interest than he gives to the Lord's work. In a church of 100 families, 37 will give nothing. I'm not saying everyone has to give the same amount. That's not what we read. I'm not saying you must, you must, you must. I am saying based on what we read, though, you want your faith to grow, test God in this and see what he does. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this time and your word. May we be changed by what it says and cheerful givers to your work, your word, and see your majesty and your ability appear before us, what you can do, how you can provide. I ask you to be with us now as we go into a time of fellowship and our potluck. Thank you for all the food and things you provided for us. Bless the food. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.